Well, hey, welcome to part two of Jesus Skeptic. Last week, I shared a little bit of my journey from investigative reporter and doubter to examining the evidence about Jesus. Today, I want to talk with you about something that I know you and I have in common, and it's this. You want to be happy. I know you want to be happy. I want to be happy. We all do. And I'm not just talking about like your team won the big game or you had a day at Disneyland. I'm talking about deep internal fulfillment. I'm talking about lasting peace. We all want it. You know, when I was a kid, I was convinced that happiness and fulfillment were found in cars. I love cars. I'm a car guy. Here's a picture of me as a kid with one of my cousins. Anything with wheels, a tractor, a truck, I just knew for sure that that's where happiness was found. And I spent my entire childhood growing up thinking, man, when I grow up, if I can work with cars, anything that has to do with brand new cars, I'd be so happy. Every Christmas and birthday, I would ask for different model cars. I would get subscriptions to Car and Driver, Road and Track, Motor Trend, Hot Rod Magazine. I probably wouldn't know how to read without those. Well, at age 21, I graduated with my journalism degree. And by age 23, the newspaper where I was working put me in charge of its press fleet. Now, what a press fleet is, is brand new cars that the manufacturers give to media outlets to drive. And so every week, I got to pick a different brand new car to drive. So here's me at 23 at the steering wheel of what looks to be an Audi. And I kid you not, every week I could pick AMG Mercedes, new BMW, Porsche, whatever I wanted. Not only could I drive them for a week... But I would get it with a full tank of gas. I never had to make any payments. I never had to pay for insurance. And here's what I learned during that time. I learned that when you have a really bad day and you slide into an AMG Mercedes, it's still a really bad day. And I learned that if you have a really good day and you get into an economy basic entry level car, it's still a really good day. You know, I got what I had always wanted in life, and then I found that I was still thirsty for something more. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like you you finally got what you wanted, and it's not that it's bad. I mean, I still love cars, but you just find yourself still unfulfilled. Maybe you thought having a baby will make me happy, and instead, all it's done is make you sleep deprived. Maybe you thought that promotion, that's what I need, and instead it's just made you more stressed out. Maybe you thought, oh, that bigger house, that's the thing, and now you're like, man, it's just more space to clean and maintain. Maybe you thought, man, if I could marry that person, then it'll be happily ever after, and you did, and it turned out to be a lot of pain, a lot of heartache, just a lot of hard work. Live long enough and you'll experience what we all experience, that you can chase fulfillment as aggressively as you want and you still find yourself longing for something else. Would you like to discover today how you can find a fulfillment that truly lasts? Would you like to know today how to have a peace that can go with you into cancer treatment, into an MRI tube if you're getting a brain scan? Well, today I want to talk with you about the defining trait of Jesus' life and claims. You see, Jesus claimed over and over again that he gives life to the full. Uh, Here's one example in John chapter 10. Jesus said, I've come that they, and he's talking about you, all the people of planet Earth, that you might have life, and not just life, but life to the full, life overflowing with fulfillment and meaning. Uh, Jesus claimed this, and what's so unique about this is that he wasn't just an inspirational teacher or a spiritual guru. Jesus claimed that he's the creator of the universe. Uh, He claimed that he shaped you, and he claimed that every desire you have is actually found in him, and that he gives you life and fulfillment, and he has an infinite reservoir. He said it this way in John chapter 4. He said, whoever drinks the water that I give will never thirst again. Jesus knew that when we got the car we wanted or the job we wanted or the relationship we wanted, that we'd still be thirsty. And he makes this audacious claim, if you come to me, if you drink your fulfillment from me, you'll never be thirsty again. Jesus makes these claims, but are they actually true? I mean, could Jesus give you the lasting fulfillment 
that nobody else and nothing else can. Well, that's what we're going to consider in our time together. Last week, I shared some of the factual investigation as I looked into Jesus. And I spent more than 10 years uh, as a skeptical person, a professional investigator, exploring the life of Jesus. And all that evidence really came down to three major categories. Here they are. First category is ancient evidence. This is evidence like Josephus and Tacitus and Suetonius, non-Christian ancient writers who wrote about this guy, Jesus of Nazareth, who clearly lived, claimed to be God. Also in ancient evidence, we could include these thousands of ancient manuscripts we have that record the actual words of Jesus. Well, the next category of evidence is what I call external evidence. And that is this reality that not only do we know Jesus lived and we know what he said, but we can also trace through the last 2,000 years his impact on humanity. These are some things that are so big that we almost miss them. For example, every atheist of tests to Jesus' birthday every time they write the date. Did you know that it's the year 2020? Because our calendar is based on a year zero of when Jesus was born. And as I looked into his impact on humanity, I learned that there are things that Jesus set in motion that I take for granted, that if you could somehow remove him from history, we wouldn't have the kind of hospitals that we have today. We learned last week just three stories out of the hundreds of followers of Jesus who actually innovated modern health care as we know it. It's the same with the founding of the university, Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, Princeton, etc., all started by Christians. It's the same with the scientific revolution, Isaac Newton, Blaise Pascal, Johannes Kepler. It's the same with the people who ended open and legal slavery, people like Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman and the abolitionists. Well, all of that evidence, because you might think, oh, John, that's too crazy. I can't believe it. Well, then get a copy of the book, Jesus Skeptic, because in the book, I document all that. And I'm telling you, as a researcher, I didn't come to any of these conclusions because someone said so. I came to them from the actual writings of these individuals, and I've documented them in the book. If you go to JesusSkeptic.com, you can get a free study guide. You can explore a lot of that evidence right online there. But let's talk today about this third kind of evidence. Because it's the evidence that for me, while the intellectual evidence is so convincing to anyone who will honestly look at it, this third kind of evidence I call internal evidence. And the reason I call it internal evidence is because Jesus' claims are about you. Jesus' claims are things that you can experience internally, but you'll find that you can never really know if they're true unless you set out to test them for yourself. You know, when I was a journalist, very often for stories, my editor would say, John, if you really want to get the story, you've got to go do it. John, if you're doing a story on skydiving, you can't just interview the people who go skydiving. You've got to skydive as well. If you're doing a story on drug addiction downtown, I want you to get in the drug house and document what it looks like. I want you to ride along with the police officers who work that beat. And I learned that as a reporter, there's a part of the story that's factual. There's another part that's human. And you have to go and experience. I'll give you a funny illustration out, out of this. And I think most of you will relate to it. Because I grew up in Michigan. And we had tons of lakes and rivers like you have here in Minnesota. And here's a picture of a waterfall that my brothers and I would go to growing up. I'll never forget this one summer, my family, we were up at this lake and we were hiking around and right at the top where this big stream pours into the lake is this waterfall. And you know, if you've been at the top of a waterfall like this, the water at the top looks very calm, but of course it's a very strong current. Well, I have three older brothers. They're all really athletic, really strong guys. And one of them, this real top athlete guy, he was sort of inching his way across the top. He was right here. And he was just kind of proving that he was stronger than the waterfall, inching his way across. And I'll never forget it because I'm watching him and all of a sudden just whoosh, I just watched the waterfall just knock him off his feet. And it starts to carry him down the waterfall. And you can't really tell it in this picture, but each of these stair steps on the waterfall, there's kind of a pool there. And the waterfall pushed him under the water. And my three brothers were all looking at him and we're waiting to see if he's going to bob back up out of the water. And there was this moment. There was this moment. Keep in mind that I'm a youngest 
I never had my own bedroom, grew up in a really cramped house. And those of you who are youngest, you'll get this, okay? I'm watching the water. We're waiting to see if his head's going to pop back up out. And I start thinking, if he doesn't pop out, I'm getting his bedroom. (laughs) You can judge me, okay? I'm a terrible person. But he did pop back up out. He's fine, all right? Some of you are super worried. He lived. Everything's okay. But here's the thing. My brothers and I learned that day the power of moving water. We learned to never underestimate the power of moving water. And here's why it's a great picture. Because in life, we all get carried along by some current. Sometimes we step into a current thinking it will lead us to fulfillment, but we don't realize that it's actually going to lead us to addiction or to darkness. We seek to be happy. We seek to be at peace. But so often we find ourselves in currents that are taking us out of happiness or currents that are taking us into anxiety instead of into peace. We step into those different things that we think will fulfill us. Like for me, man, if I could just drive brand new cars every day, that'd be it. And we get it and we realize this didn't take me where I thought this would take me. And here's what I realized. Once I saw the evidence that Jesus lived, he's impacted history, his followers have done these great things, I had this realization. I'll never know for sure if the current of Jesus can carry me to fulfillment. He says it does. But I'll never know, is that true or not, unless I step into the current. I mean, the only way to really experience that part of Jesus is for me to to try it. You know, could Jesus actually give you fulfillment that nothing else can? You'll never know until you try it. Could he actually give you peace when you're going through suffering? You'll never know unless you try it. Well, let me tell you two stories of people who gave everything they had in the pursuit of fulfillment and happiness. Each of these guys, I spent three months And I mean, when I was a journalist, I got to tell you guys, I worked seven days a week and usually, you know, 10 hours a day. I was young, I was single, and I was a workaholic. I loved what I did. And both of these guys, I spent a good three months documenting everything about their life. I mean, I talked to kids they went to school with back when they were young. I talked to their children. I talked to their parents. I talked to their neighbors. I learned everything about these guys. And let me tell you about the first one. This guy on the left, this is Scott Coles. Scott Coles, the reason I did a cover story on him is that when he was 42 years old, he had built an empire worth $1 billion. Now, if you're not a math person or it's been a while, let me just put that into context for you. I want you to imagine today that I give you a million dollars. You're welcome, right? A million dollars. You multiply that times 100, multiply that times 10. That's how much Scott Coles had. Scott Coles didn't just have homes, he had estates. He had a huge one in the richest area of Phoenix, and he bought all these other mansions so he could tear them down and build his own 18-hole golf course in his front yard. When I saw Scott Coles' garage as a car guy, I flipped out. I mean, Rolls-Royce, Ferrari, Bentley, you name it. Scott Coles had homes in San Diego and in Aspen, Colorado. He had a beautiful wife. He had healthy children. And Scott Coles, I mean, he aggressively pursued anything that would make him happy. And at age 42, tragically, he concluded that his life wasn't worth living anymore, and he took his own life. I mean, at the prime of life, with everything a person could want. It revealed this to me, that many roads marked fulfillment turn out to be life-devouring dead ends. I mean, the road sign says fulfillment, you hop on it, you drive And it ends up to be a dead end, or even worse, in Scott's case, a drop-off. I mean, I'll never be the same after seeing firsthand a person who had everything that most of us think would lead to happiness, and it led, in his case, to tragedy. I remember thinking, man, if a beautiful wife and children can't bring fulfillment, if those kind of mansions and cars can't bring fulfillment, then there's no hope for me, because there's no way I'll ever have a fraction of the stuff that this guy had. And it led me to really consider what am I really hoping will carry me to fulfillment? Well, as I was wrestling with that and I had concluded, yes, Jesus lived. His followers have done a lot of good. He's perhaps the most influential person in history. My editors assigned me to write a story about this guy, Brian Welch. 
Brian had been a musician in a band called Korn. His music videos were playing on MTV. He had won Grammy Awards, had millions of dollars. And in the pursuit of fulfillment and happiness, Brian had gotten addicted to drugs. The drugs took Brian down a deep, deep, dark path. Brian described to me times when he was high on drugs and his wife was high on drugs and he would look down and he would see his wife's blood on his knuckles. Brian described to me a time when, as he's just doing everything he can, grabbing for fulfillment, that he woke up one morning after having been on drugs all night and his toddler, little girl, is sitting on a pool chair next to their big pool with no cover on it. And she'd been sitting there all night, sleeping on a towel. And Brian, he just realized none of this is working, but he didn't know what would work. And then there was this Easter Sunday where someone invited Brian into a church a lot like Eagle Brook, a church in California near one of Brian's homes. And that Sunday, he wandered in there. His brain was still coming down off of some drugs. But this verse got through to him, this claim of Jesus, where Jesus says to you, come to me, all of you who are weary and you're burdened, Jesus says, I see you and I care. And if you'll come to me, I will give you rest. This rest that Jesus talks about, it's rest for your soul. It's rest for your inner person. It's rest that, that no matter what's going on in your life, you can be at peace. I spent three weeks with Brian and his daughter, Jenna, after his faith in Christ. And after he believed in Christ, God gave him the power to get free from his addiction to drugs. He chose to walk away from his career. He gave up a lot of his wealth. And one day when Brian and I were hanging out, and I was kind of doing this story to poke and see, like, is this real? Is this transformation real? Here's what Brian told me. He said, John, I had $3 million in cash sitting in the bank. I had all the cars I wanted, a $200,000 pool. I had nannies and the nicest house and real estate in California, and I was miserable. And then here's Brian's own words. He says, then I found God, and I was like, this is all I've ever wanted. I didn't find what I was looking for in all that stuff. This is the evidence of internal change, but you'll only ever be able to test it if you take Jesus at his word and say, okay, Jesus, I'm going to try it. Here's the thing. If you're seeking fulfillment, if you're seeking inner rest, well, you're exactly the kind of person who Jesus invites, just like Brian, and who Jesus helps. You know, it doesn't matter what you've done in life. You might think, I'm, I'm too messed up for Jesus. Man, Brian, the stories he told me, none of us, we all have shame. We all have guilt. There's no mistakes in your past that Jesus can't wash away. That's the beauty of it. Freedom from your shame. Freedom from your guilt. I saw this in Brian's life. I've now experienced this in my life. I didn't have the dramatic highs and lows of, of Brian. I had a fairly normal life where I pursued the things that I thought would make me happy, but I've found in Jesus what I was always seeking as well. Well, maybe you're listening to this and you're thinking, okay, John, that's interesting about, you know, Brian and, you know, but I'm, I'm, I'm more normal. I, I'm more just kind of, I'm, I'm not that bad of a person. I live a fairly normal life. Is this Jesus fulfillment really for me? Well, I got to tell you about a skeptic I came across right after I had affirmed that, okay, Jesus lived, and I started reading his life. This is a skeptic who lived back in the time of Jesus. This is a skeptic who actually had seen Jesus with his own eyes, but he couldn't believe Jesus' grand claims about being God and dying on the cross for the sins of the world and offering peace and, and life. This guy refused to believe that stuff. In fact, this guy was not only not a Christian, he was anti-Christian. He would go around messing with God's people and, and just trying to mess them up. And then one day he had this transformational moment where he saw Jesus and he believed in Jesus. And he found that Jesus' promises were true. And this same guy who had hated Jesus 
ended up giving his life to plant a whole bunch of churches and to help start the Jesus movement as we know it today. He gave his life to what he was against. Why would he do that? Well, he writes why he did it in a letter to one of these churches, the church in Rome. And here's what he says in Romans 1.16. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. This guy's name had been Saul, and then after he believes, he changes his name to Paul, and he gives his life to the very thing that he was a skeptic of. And now, as people hate him for being a Christian, he says, I'm not ashamed of this. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. What's the gospel? It's the very simple good news that God loves you so much that he'd rather die on a cross to be with you than be in heaven without you. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it's the very power of God. And that's what I've experienced in my life. This isn't just some ancient belief. This is the gateway into the very power of God that can change your life, that can give you fulfillment that nothing else can. And this former skeptic from the very first generation of Christians says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God. And it brings salvation. That is freedom from your addictions, from your mistakes, from your shame. The certainty of eternal life after this life ends, it's available to everyone who believes. Belief is like stepping into the current and saying, okay, I'm going to see where this takes me. I mean, every day people step into different currents. They, they play the lottery thinking, maybe if I do this every day, this will bring me fulfillment. Or they start another thing, and a lot of these things aren't bad things, but we try different currents every day. Have you really tried Jesus? Have you ever really stepped into that current? I mean, in my case, why would I abandon a career that, that I really enjoyed? Why would I give up driving press cars every day? To be what, when I was a journalist, I thought pastors were the lamest thing in the world. I'm sorry. I, I thought, you know, if you could have told me 15 years ago that I'd be a pastor someday, like, why in the world? Well, the answer is because it actually works. I mean, I've experienced it internally. This really works, but you won't experience it unless you get in the river, unless you believe in Jesus. And once you experience it, you realize this is what everyone's looking for. Fulfillment is found in Jesus. Peace is found in Jesus. I've seen it. I live it. And every skeptic who actually gives it a try finds it to be true. Jesus invites you today to find that fulfillment in him. He invites you today to find that rest in him, but it's a choice that only you can make. You know, I think of this first skeptic, Saul, like one domino in a long line of dominoes that led all the way up to people like Brian Welch and to me and maybe to you today. But one of my favorite verses as I went through all the evidence of Jesus for my mind, and then I realized I'm never going to know if it's true or not unless I step out, was this verse. God makes you a promise here. He says, you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. You know, it's one thing to seek God with your mind. And for me, that was the beginning. But there came a point where I had to seek him with my heart. I had to seek God not only with my brain, but with my very being. Well, I just want to address one hurdle, because when I was a skeptic, I remember having intellectual doubts, but I also remember having doubts because of Christians who I'd seen, who I thought were either hypocrites or were just really mean people or bad people. And I want to address this really quickly, because I just know there's someone watching right now, and God's kind of moving in your heart, and you're considering this, but you still have this hesitation because you've encountered some Christians who put a bad taste in your mouth. And to talk about this, let me give you a picture of some food, because there was a time right after Mel and I got married, where we went out to a nice restaurant. It was a Chinese restaurant, and I got the worst food poisoning of my life. I won't describe in detail the food poisoning, but man, I decided the next day after I went through the food poisoning, I'm never eating at that restaurant again. And it's the truth. It's been 14 years. I've never been back to that particular restaurant. But here's the good news. I didn't give up on eating. I gave up on that restaurant. And even if I'm traveling, speaking somewhere, and people say, hey, do you want to go to such and such? I say, no, thank you. But I haven't given up on eating. 
And I just want to encourage you, if you're considering Jesus, but some of his followers have caused you to trip up, they've put a bad taste in your mouth, I want to encourage you, Jesus is bigger than those followers. And this is why churches like Eagle Brook are so important. Because sadly, people have done things in the name of Jesus that, that haven't been great at times. But just like we don't give up on all restaurants just because some have food poisoning, don't completely give up on the God of universe just because some people who claim to follow him are a little bit weird. And I want to say to you, Eagle Brook, if it wasn't for a church like Eagle Brook in Arizona, I, I wouldn't know Jesus today. If it wasn't for a church like Eagle Brook in California, Brian Welch, who I told you about, wouldn't know Jesus today. And if it wasn't for Eagle Brook, there's tens of thousands of people here in Minnesota who wouldn't know Christ today. And you've got to know you're so important. We need followers of Jesus in churches that are, are safe places for doubters and skeptics to come in. Well, I told you some of the dramatic stories that I encountered as a journalist and a reporter, and I'll close with one more. One day, my newspaper editor, he assigned me to profile a heroin crisis that was going on in the city of Phoenix. And I reached out to one of my sources who kind of knew the underbelly of Phoenix, and I said, I've got to get into an actual drug house. No, I'm, I'm not wanting to buy any, okay? I just need to be there as a reporter. I need to actually talk to these heroin addicts who are right at the very end of their life because people were overdosing on heroin. And he got me into this drug house in a really rough neighborhood in Phoenix. And in there, I met a 19-year-old girl named Mickey. I talked Mickey into going on a walk with me to a nearby Jack in the Box. And we sat in this booth at a Jack in the Box. And I started meeting with Mickey while I wrote this story. I'll never forget sitting across from her in those uh, kind of hard plastic booths there at Jack in the Box. And, and Mickey, she was often shaking because she was going through withdrawals. Her body was just emaciated from lack of nourishment. She had these electric blue eyes. And there was this little bit of life that was still within her. And as I talked with Mickey, I learned that her dad's an attorney. She had grown up in a really nice middle upper class neighborhood. She'd been a normal little girl who grew up with teddy bears and stuffed animals on her bed. One day at a party, Mickey tried some marijuana and it became a gateway drug. From the day she took heroin, she never stopped. I mean, it completely devoured her life. Mickey would do whatever she had to do to get these $20 balloons of Mexican black tar heroin. And as I talked with Mickey, it was so heartbreaking. There were days that her brain wouldn't work quite right, and she'd say words like agishing, this like weird mix of agonizing and anguish and she was in so much suffering, and she wanted to get out of it so bad. Well, I ended up, as I was doing my story, getting in touch with the best addiction treatment center there in Arizona. And I described Mickey to them. And I said, I, I know you guys are real expensive, but it'd be good publicity for you guys if I could get Mickey to agree to come to your facility. I could write about it. Lots of people would know about you guys. Would you give her free treatment if I can talk her into going? They talked it over, and they decided, yes, they would. So I explained it to Mickey, and Mickey said, yeah, that's what I want. And so this day came where the van pulled up in front of the drug house where Mickey lived. And I'll never forget it, because there was about a 20-foot-long sidewalk from that front door of the drug house to this van. And I was behind the van in my own car, and I remember sitting there. Mickey didn't come out. And I remember going up to the door, and and knocking on the door, and I knew that Mickey was on the other side of that door. And the one thing that she wanted, freedom, it was right there on the other side of the door. For whatever reason, that addiction, it was, had its hooks in her mind, and biologically, Mickey, she never did open that door. And here's the thing. I know there's someone watching this right now, and you're thinking, yeah, this is kind of interesting, but... I still don't know. I want to tell you today that God has pulled up in a van for you today. And he's not saying, will you believe tomorrow? He's also not saying, will you be perfect? Or will you have all your questions answered? But he is saying this, come to me, all you who are weary, burdened. I'm offering rest. 
It's freely available. I actually agonized on the cross to purchase it for you, but only you can decide. I reached a point in my journey where I realized I can't keep putting this decision off. I've got to open that door. I've got to step out. I've got to test what Jesus said. And I've got to find out, can he actually give me this rest for my soul? I wonder, will you come to him today? Will you believe in him today? Will you let him wash your guilt and shame away? Will you step your foot into the current that has carried more people to fulfillment and peace than any other movement in all of history. It's a choice that only you can make. I believe God led you into this moment. He wants to help you make that choice right now. I want to help you. So I'm just going to pray with you right now. And if you feel God working in your heart, uh, you can just call out to him. Prayer is simply talking to God. If you feel him working in your heart, you just say, yes, Jesus, I, I do want to respond to you. You can even say it out loud if you're watching on a screen somewhere. You say, yes, Jesus, I, 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 I do believe you died for me. I, I don't have it all figured out, but I, I want this fulfillment. I want this forgiveness of sins. I want this eternal life. I'm going to pray that for you right now. Just keep, keep praying it out from your heart. Jesus, Lord, right now I pray for every person watching who needs fulfillment. They need peace. They need rest. And God, right now you've pulled up and you're inviting them, you're beckoning them. And Lord, you say in your word that if we believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we will be saved. Oh God, I've experienced it in my own life. Yes, it's intellectually valid, but it's spiritually real and it works in real life. And God, I just pray for anyone right now who's on the fence. Lord, would they open the door? Would they walk out to you? Would they step in? Would they believe? God, I'm asking all this in the power of Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hey, if you did believe today, or even if you just think, I think I'm starting to, here's what you can do. You can text the word BEGIN to 757-787. Text the word BEGIN, or if you're watching online in the comment section, you can just type that word, begin. Well, I've been honored to be with you, Eagle Brook, and uh, I look forward to seeing you guys at some point in the future. But next week, make sure you don't miss it. Jason's got an awesome series planned for you guys. Take care.